So we say this is a psalm, of course, of David, and it's a psalm that we're entitling A Soul Set Free. And if you are, in fact, a believer this afternoon, if your soul has been set free, if you have been saved, then you can relate with David concerning a desire to praise the Lord. David, I believe, is going to give us reasons here why we should, in fact, bless or praise the Lord. And certainly, if we were to take the time, the list would, we would be, we would be here, I would surpass uh, the Apostle Paul preaching past midnight. I guarantee you, if we, uh, we talk about uh, count your many blessings, name them ton by ton, not one by one, amen, because there's so many of them. But he begins with the word bless. Bless means to kneel before, to adore, to praise the Lord. And of course, why? Why should we praise the Lord? Why should we adore him? Why should we worship him? Uh, for all his benefits, because of who he is, really. Let me ask you two sobering questions before we get into the message. The first question is, what can we bring to God that he has not given to us? I hear, I hear somebody saying it. What's the only thing we can bring to God that he hasn't given to us? Our sin. Isn't that right? I mean, any, 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 you know, the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes down from above. So if we bring anything else besides our sin, guess what? It came from God. But what God has not given to us, what we got on our own, and what we inherited actually, is sin. And so the only thing that we can bring to God that he hasn't given to us is our sin. Second sobering question, what can I give to God that he needs? Yeah, what can, I, what can you give to God that he needs from you? What can you give, what can we give to God that he really needs? The answer is nothing. You know, there are some, there are some teachings that say, well, God created us because he wanted fellowship. God doesn't need to have fellowship. He's perfect in and of himself. He really doesn't need fellowship. He, does, he doesn't need praise. He doesn't need to be glorified. He, he is all in all. He's perfect. He doesn't need anything. And so if we're going to bring something to him that we didn't receive from him, and it's only our sin. Secondly, what can we give to him that he needs? And the answer is zero, nothing. God doesn't need anything. And yet he has chosen to love you and me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all... That is within me. What does that mean to you? And all that is within me, bless his holy name. I think those words, and all that is within me, we are so far removed from what those words mean. Can you say amen? Do you understand what I'm saying? We are so far removed from all that is in, within me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and every fiber of my being. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Anyone that even begins to get close to that is labeled a fanatic. Yeah, in the day that we live, I guarantee you. They are labeled a fanatic. You are a fanatic. You're always got your head in the word of God. You're always praying. You're always handing out tracts. You're always witnessing. You're always in the church. You're always, you're a fanatic. Fool for Christ. That's what Paul was. A fool for Christ. When I think of all that is within me, the Lord brings my mind over to Deuteronomy chapter number 6. In Deuteronomy chapter number 6, Hear, O Israel, are the first two words of a section of the Torah, and it is entitled the Shema, of a prayer that serves as a centerpiece of the morning and evening of the Jewish prayer services. The first verse encapsulates the monotheistic essence of Judaism. That's one of the, that's one of the problems that the Jews has with, with accepting the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as Savior, as the Messiah. Uh, our belief in the Bible teaching of the Trinity, that's the problem they have. They, they say we, we are believing in many gods. 
And so there's only one true and living God to them. And so uh, monotheistic to them. And then they're saying that we're, we're, uh, we're claiming that there's three gods, not one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And we find this in Deuteronomy 6.4. Observant Jews considered the Shema to be the most important part of the prayer service in Judaism and its twice daily recitation as a mitzvah, religious commandment. It is traditional for the Jews to say the Shema as their last words each day. And it's really important that the parents teach their children to say it before they go to sleep at night. I certainly don't want to demean the Jews by any by any stretch, but what I see here, and I, I, I've always believed that Catholicism and Judaism are very similar because they're so traditional and uh, they're so religious. And again, those that are involved in those religions are still trying to work their way to heaven. And so I would say that any, any prayer that you pray over and over again, the Hail Mary, for instance, uh, any prayer that you pray over and over again, the Lord has, has told us not to do it. He says, when you pray, pray not as the heathen pray, with vain repetition. And all of us, I would say, I, I, I'm saying, I know, I was a former Roman Catholic. I would say probably every single Roman Catholic who's converted to another religion will never, ever forget the Hail Mary. How could you forget that? I mean, if there's anything I prayed as a child going to sleep at night, it would be the Hail Mary. You just, you know, hit the button. It's like just put it in, uh, you know, put it in, uh, what would you call that when the airplane is flying? Autopilot. Put it in autopilot. You don't have to think anymore. You just put it in auto autopilot. It's like driving the standard car. You don't have to think, okay, what gear do I need to go to? It's automatic. And so you say the Hail Mary, just automatic. Why? Because it's entrenched. It's vain repetition though. The Lord doesn't want us to pray with vain repetition. Jesus made that plain and clear. He said, when you pray to the Father, he says, you pray in my name and he'll give you what you want, but not praying over and over and over and over and over and forever and ever the same, same words. What if I stood up here and I just kept saying the same words over and over and over again? I think our church would be a lot smaller, amen? <laughs> I would think after the first or second service, people would say, pastors, you know, I knew he was old, but he's really gone out of it now, and so we're going to go look for another church. You know, our Heavenly Father's not any different. He doesn't want to hear the same thing over and over and over again. That's not our heart. First of all, that prayer is not something that we thought of. It's someone else thought of it, and it's a memorized prayer. God doesn't want a memorized prayer. God wants us, the Bible said, he wants us to serve him from the heart. It says right here, that's our study tonight. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Talking to him from my heart, not from something that somebody else wrote down and said I should memorize and pray. And it's not even to him. How wrong is that? Well, we find here that the next verse actually uh, in Deuteronomy 6.5 is, is the point that I'm trying to make. When I think of the, the phrase, and all that is within me, my mind goes back to Deuteronomy 6.5, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. To me, that is, that is the saying the same thing that we find, and all that is within me were to bless his holy name. What does that mean? That means that we are to do it with all of our soul, all of our heart, and all of our might. That's the way we're to love God, with every fiber of our being. And yet, how far removed are we from doing that? How far has the world, how far has the church been removed from the early church, from the New Testament church? in their worship, in their dedication, in their sacrifice, in their willingness to die for the Lord. We should be blessing the Lord every single day, every single moment of every single day, with every single fiber of our body. And again, if we do that, we would be weird even to many Christians. 
We really think that we're doing something special when we give God a few hours a week. Yeah, it's true. Why? Because we compare ourselves with those that only give the Lord one hour a week. Yeah, we compare ourselves with, with ourselves, and that's wrong as well, but it makes us feel better. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. We're moving on to verse 2 so you can breathe, okay? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not all of his benefits. Now, this is what we're going to be looking at in this psalm. We're going to be looking at, we're not going to be looking at all his benefits. Again, if we looked at all his benefits, we would be here an awful long time, okay? But we're going to be looking at some of the benefits. You know, if somebody goes to get a job today, I'm not sure how it is here in the Philippines, but I guarantee you in the United States, when someone goes out and they apply for a job, you know, one of the questions they're asking now, what are the benefits? Years ago, that would never happen. Years ago, you ask, what are the benefits? And they'd say, okay, uh, uh, we'll call you if we need you. You can go now. I'm, I'm serious. If somebody went years ago and they, the first question out of their mouth is, what are, what are my benefits going to be? They would have been, okay, just fill the application, leave it on the table, and we'll, we'll call you. And really what they're saying is, you have a wrong attitude to work for our company. You're looking for what's in it for you instead of being a team player and how you can help the company. It is the same mindset for churches today. Come to the pastor and, Pastor, what are the benefits? What can you do for my family? That is so far removed from years gone by when a family would pray and say, Lord, lead us to the church where you want us to worship you. Lead us to a church where we can use our gifts and our talents and be a blessing to that ministry. We are so far removed where now they come and say, okay, what do you have to offer? What do you have to offer for our kids? What do you have to offer for our teenagers? What do you have to offer? Let, let's see your list. And as I said before, it's like a, a, a restaurant. Let, let's see your menu. We want to see if the menu looks good to us. God help us. God help us to be different. Some of the benefits... Everybody likes benefits. I mean, come on, our flesh loves benefits. How many days off? How many paid vacation? I mean, what are the perks? How, uh, how soon can I get a promotion, you know, my, my pay raise? And I don't know, a lot of companies, of course, now that things have changed, they accept that, I guess, but it's, it's so in your face and it's so wrong uh, to have that mindset. But again, the world is waxing worse and worse. Who forgetteth all thine iniquities? Verse number 3a. Who forgetteth all thine iniquities? That is a big benefit. Can you say amen? You know, we cannot talk about, we cannot take the time to talk about all the benefits that we have, and yet the Lord tells us, but I have taken care of all your sin. Now, as I, was, as I was preparing this, I thought, is there a day, is there a day that has gone by that you and I have not sinned? Some of you are going, and you're probably right when you go, no. Uh, come on, let's be honest. Is there a day, I mean, 24-hour day has gone by and you haven't had a bad thought. You haven't said a bad word. You haven't done an, an idle deed. I mean, guilty is charged if, we, if we'll be honest and transparent. So what I did is I got the calculator, 69 years old, 69 times 365, 25,185. That's how many days, times, how many times per day did I sin? Don't even want to go there, amen? But just once a day, if I sin just once a day, over 25,000, and that's only going back to my last birthday. That's not going past. Over 25,000. I don't know about you, but if you stop and think, God doesn't want vain repetition in our, in our prayers. I mean, when does God get tired of forgiving our sin? 
25,000 plus. But that's how great our God is. And that's how great his sacrifice was and his payment for our sin, that he could cover over 25,000 times how many sins that I've committed. In the original language, this is not talking about mistakes. When someone wrongs you, it's not hard to forgive them. Number one, if it's the first offense. And then number two, if it was done by accident. Very easy. Oh, you didn't mean it. I remember when we were on a furlough and we were, I was at the post office. And I'm parked over here in, in this, this elderly woman. Now, if I tell you she's an elderly woman, you got to realize she's old. Amen? I mean, it, you know, age is relative, but if I'm telling you she's old, that means, you know, at least she's older than I am. And so there was an elderly woman, and she's backing up, and I'm backing up, and of course, I look up in my rear view, and I see we're both backing into each other. And so I hit my brakes, but she doesn't look in her rear view, and she keeps coming, and she backs into me. And fortunately, it wasn't really bad. I, I, I can't even remember now. It was a, what we call a fender bender. It, was, it wasn't a, you know, a lot of damage. Uh, maybe just the, the fender bent just a little bit. But anyway, we both get out of the car. I pulled back up. She pulled back up. And I went over and, and I told her, I said, well, you know, I don't think it's bad enough to worry about. Of course, she's the one that backed into me. So if there was any payment to be made, certainly I could have said, well, sorry, lady. I was stopped. You kept coming. So it's your fault. And it was, and I don't think she'd argue, but I told her, never mind. Well, I didn't know, but she knew the people we were staying with, the Newtons, Mel and Judy Newton. And she knew them, and, and somehow, some way, she got, they met Judy and the lady, and, and she said, oh, that nice young man. He was, he was so nice, and, you know, I backed into him, and he said, it's okay, just go ahead and go away. And, and I thought, you know, it's easy to forgive somebody when it's by accident. But how, how often do you and I choose to sin? On purpose. When we know it's sin, when we know it's wrong, when we know it's against the Word of God and the will of God, how often are we guilty of choosing to sin on purpose? And yet God is there to forgive our iniquities. And that's the kind it's talking about. It's a whole different story when someone wrongs you on purpose. Someone does something against you because they don't like you or they hate you or whatever the case may be. I know that there are other Christians or some Christians who, because of the way that they have been offended, they refuse to forgive, and certainly that's wrong. And they allow themselves to be held bondage by their own choice of never forgiving. The word here, iniquity, is from the word avon, which means perversity or evil. We are that way by nature. The heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Only God. Only God, Only God knows how wicked your heart and my heart is and what we are capable of doing. And, and many times I think we... We are very naive in thinking when we see someone else commit a sin, we're thinking how wicked they are and how terrible they are. And they're, they're claiming to be a child of God and they're doing something like that. Understand that you and I are capable of doing something worse than they have done. Yet complete and total forgiveness is offered to all those who repent and believe. What a great... God we have. What a merciful God we have. And then we see, uh, who healeth all thy diseases. And of course, you're going to have the faith healers go to this verse and going to say, it's God's will for no one to be sick. And of course, that's easy to refute because the Apostle Paul had the thorn in the flesh. He prayed to God three times, and guess what? God says, no, I'm not going to remove it. You need that to keep you humble. And so we know that that is not the case for the Lord to heal every sickness. You know, God, I believe, uses 
disease and sickness many times to, to humble us and to make us more dependent upon the Lord, to in fact praise Him, to in fact come to Him, to in fact realize He's there to help us. Because without the sickness, without the disease, without the problem, certainly we fail to come to the Lord. In verse number two, we, we were as a, a, a penitent person, a, a, a person who's repenting, a person who's coming to the Lord, a person that needs to be saved. Here, more like a patient, okay, in verse number three. Actually, though, if you study this out, in verse three, where it talks about who healeth all thy diseases, it's really not talking about physical. It's not talking about the body. It's talking about healing the soul. God can, and of course, most certainly does heal the body. I like to uh, use Mark 2 because that's familiar to us, the four, four committed friends who brought the paralytic to the Lord. Was the Lord able to, to heal his body? Yes, take up thy bed and walk. And they were all amazed and glorified God. Why? Because of the miracle. God was able to take care of his physical body, and even the Pharisees and the scribes that were there, they were amazed as well. But what's more important, not only for the paralytic, but what's more important for mankind is not the healing of a disease physically, but the healing of our soul spiritually. That's the most important. That's what he's speaking of. Speaking of the soul in verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. The greatest healing that anyone can receive is the healing of their soul. Why? Because the healthiest person in the world can, is eventually going to die. I don't care how healthy that person is. I don't care how old that person is. Mom showed me something on the Internet that she saw the other day, 129 years old, something like that. Don't quote me on the age, but you can look online and find it. This lady, 100 and, you know, she's in her teens, 100 and, 120 something, and she was miserable, right? She made the statement something to the effect, and you can shake your head no if it's wrong or make a face or whatever, <laughs> that she said she hasn't ever had a happy day of her whole life. She hasn't had a happy day. She's living over 100 years old, 120-some years old, and she says, I haven't ever had a happy day my whole life. Well, you know what I would tell you? I, I'll take a wild guess. She's not a believer. She's not a believer. I guarantee you she's not a believer. And if she is, she's not living like a believer. She's not thinking like a believer if she is. But I don't believe that she's a believer just from the statements that she makes on the Internet. And I think she wanted to, to die, right? Yeah. Why am I living this long in this miserable life? Uh, I pray somebody sees that, somebody that lives by her, somebody who knows who it is, and they go over and tell her, look, there's joy. You can have joy in this life. The last days of your life, you can, you can be blessed. You can have a great change in your life. You should not be living that type of life that is uh, a terrible life, and the length of your life is so long, and every day you're saying you hate it, and it's no good, and you're suffering, and having all of these problems. The Lord is talking here about healing, healing not only the body, but spiritual healing. You see, the person who is healthy, they're depending upon their health, and they're thinking, I don't have a problem, I'm healthy. My BP's fine, you know, I don't have diabetes, I don't have heart problems, I don't have any, uh, any uh, cancer, there's none in my family, I'm going to live forever. No, they're not going to live forever. It's appointed on the man wants to die. After, de after death, the judgment, the Bible says. But when our soul gets healed, when we get saved, guess what? Now we have eternal life. Spiritually, we'll never die. Amen? Those of us that know the Lord, we can rejoice. Then he says in verse 4, he said, Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Destruction from a life of vanity is the idea in this verse. Before the Lord came into our life, it was a life of vanity. Can you say amen? Before the Lord came into our life, it was a life of vanity. It was a life of emptiness. It was a life where we had no purpose. We may have thought we had a purpose, 
And most of us, the purpose we had is let's, uh, let's eat, drink, and be merry, or let's get rich, and let's make an investment, and let's retire early. I mean, certainly the flesh would love that. And yet we find out that God, the Lord Jesus Christ, came into this world. He says, I've come to give you life and life more abundant. I've come to give you life with purpose. Jesus said, what profit of a man if he shall gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? Solomon discovered that without the Lord at the center of his life, that all was vanity, emptiness, unsatisfaction, or unsatisfactory, vexation. He uses the term vex vexation, which would mean irritation of spirit. Sounds like the lady that's old. She's irritated. She has an irritated spirit. She's, she's not enjoying life. Not a day of her life has gone by. She hasn't had pain and agony and suffering and all of these terrible things. She needs to get saved. She needs to be redeemed. Paul gives a list of what man does by nature in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Lust of the flesh. Not a nice list, but it's what we do by nature. If you want to write it down, look, look it up later. It's all of the, lust of the works of the flesh. Description of a life of destruction. A life that God has redeemed us from. And a life... Sad to say that those who are lost are still living. You know, it's, we said that the natural man doesn't understand the things of God. They don't understand spiritual principles. They don't understand the Word of God. And yet, once we get saved, it's hard to understand where we came from and how we existed before we got saved. Can you say amen? Do you, do you agree with that? In other words, looking back over, you know, the 25 years of having a religion but not having a relationship and just really going through life with real, really no real purpose. But when I got saved, that was the real purpose for me, for my existence, getting saved, knowing the Lord, starting to now have a purpose in living for him and shining for him and telling others how great he is and, and all about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I didn't have that before. And to, to have the knowledge of the truth and to see so many that don't have it and yet so many that seemingly don't want it. And yet the majority of mankind remain in ignorance and sad to say that few in comparison who have the truth. What is the percentage? What is the terrible low percentage of those of us that have the truth that are doing anything with it to help those that don't have the truth? Amen. What is the terrible low percentage of us that have the truth and are doing absolutely nothing with it to help those that don't have the truth? The Bible says, how can they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How can they hear without a preacher? You don't have to be a preacher. How can they hear without a witness? How can they hear without a Christian telling them? We need to be responsible. And in verse 4b, he said, Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, more benefits of being saved. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. Praise the Lord for that verse. Verses 8 and 9. That's what we just read. Thank the Lord for his love and mercy to us. His mercy has been manifested to us time and time and time again. The Bible is very clear. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. The reason why you and I are here tonight 
enjoying the air conditioning, listening to the word of God, being blessed by God himself is only because of the mercy of God. It's the only reason. Not because we're better than people outside these walls. We're not any better. We're not any better than a terrible sinner. We're not any better. We're more privileged, for sure, but we're not any better. Except for the grace of God, there goes you and there goes me, living the life they're living. If it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. That's a good verse to memorize. Because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We sing that, great is thy faithfulness. Why? Because great is his faithfulness. God is faithful. God keeps his word. And thank God for his mercy. It's because of the Lord's loving kindness to us that we also are the recipients of his tender mercies. I believe that. In other words, his tender mercies come to us because of his love to us. They're, they're a, a, another benefit, and they are a result because God has chosen to love you and I. Now we not only get his love, but praise God, we get his mercy as well. You see, when God shows you his mercy and shows me his mercy, we don't get what we deserve. If he withheld his mercy and he didn't give us his mercy and shower us with his mercy, we wouldn't be here tonight. We would be in hell tonight. Hell had enlarged itself. We would be there. And we wouldn't have the air conditioning. Amen? No, we wouldn't. According to the word of God, place of torment. The worm dieth not. Going to be the lake of fire for all eternity. And because of that truth that we just said, because of his, his uh, because of the Lord's mercies were not consumed, we find over in the next verse, verse number 10 of our psalm, look, listen to what it says. He had not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Now, the term there, rewarded, doesn't sound good. You know, I'm going to reward you by sending you to hell. No, that doesn't sound good at all. I'm going to reward you by, you know, judging you, and you're going to be separated from me throughout eternity. But it's what we, what we deserve. But because of his mercies, he has not dealt with us after our sins. Nor has he given to us what we deserve according to our iniquities, according to the, the sins that we've committed on purpose. Now, all of us are guilty. You have done things you know. This is wrong, but yet the flesh is weak. And what did you do? You yielded to the sin, and you committed that sin on purpose. Nobody deceived you. You have the Holy Spirit of God living within you to lead you and guide you, us in all truth. Don't think for a second I'm up here self-righteous pointing down at you. Whenever I tell you anything, I'm saying it to me too before I ever got up here. You understand what I'm saying? We're all in this together. But thank God. Can you thank God tonight for his mercy? Can you thank God tonight for his grace? Can you thank God tonight with every fiber in your soul and in your life to bless him, to bless his holy name? We should. In verses 11 and 12, if I told uh, Brother Peter, Peter, we're going we're gonna to need, need some wood. I want you to go get a metro. I want, want you to go get the, 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 uh, the measuring, and I want, I want you to measure the board that we're going to have. Well, God is saying here, if you want to measure my mercy, I'm going to tell you how you can measure my mercy. Verses 11 and 12. Look at it with me. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. I don't think there's a, uh, I don't think there is a measuring, I guess maybe with the laser. But then where do you stop when you start going up into the heaven? Where do you stop? How many miles do you, do you I mean, if you, if you go out 
into the universe, man is not even capable of finding the end in all of the galaxies and, and the expanse of God's creation. We are so limited, we don't even know how big it is. With all the equipment and all the technology that we have today, and the Lord said, you want to measure my mercy, start from earth and then just keep going. Let me know when you get to the end. <laughs> Look at verse 12. It's just as good. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. What wisdom. What wisdom. What if the Lord said, as far as the north is from the south, I'm going to remove your sins. Well, you get the day out, you put one end at the north pole, you put one end at the south pole, say, okay, there's a limit here. As far as the east is from the west, there's no east pole. There's no <laughs> west pole. If you keep going east, guess what? You keep going east all the way around, and you'll keep going through eternity. You'll never come to west if you keep going east. You'll do the other, turn around, go west, west, west. You'll never come to east as long as you keep going west. The wisdom of God. Amen. Amen. He's telling us how much he loves us. He's telling us how secure we are in him. Another reason to bless him. Another reason to praise him. Another reason to thank him. Verse 13, we have a, uh, the believer has a father-son relationship. Of course, we know that's all the way in the New Testament everywhere. Came unto his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him. That's believing. That's true faith. Not only when we say, I believe in Jesus, but when I receive him as my Lord and Savior. As many as received him to them, who? To those that believe and receive. It's synonymous. To as many as receive him. To them he gave power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now we are the sons of God. Doth not yet appear. Not... Don't have to wait. Thank God for that. God is, a, God is a God that wants us to have faith and wants us to believe. And he tells us you don't have to wait. By faith, we're already seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I believe we're there tonight. We're here physically, but we're secure in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And he, thank God he does have pity on us because we need to be pitied because we are so far removed from what we should be. He knows us better than we know ourselves in verse 14. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 14, for he knoweth our frame he remembers that we are what? Dust. Everything returns to dust. Isn't that right? You, you ladies, you get the, the dust deal and you go and you dust the furniture and guess what? The next day you go and what's there? More dust. Never ends. And the Lord, the Lord told us, he said, you came from dust, from dust thou shalt return. Go dig up a, a grave that's been buried for how long, and you'll see that what's inside? Dust. <laughs> Everything turns back to dust. Well, look at verse 5. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. Now, I'm not going to say who, but, I, but somebody came into my office right before the service, and they brought some... Something to mom and I that I guarantee you is going to satisfy my mouth with good things. They're sweet things. Amen? And I thank that person for doing that. And uh, that's the way our Lord is, though. Our Lord wants to give us satisfaction in this life, joy in this life, peace in this life. I like what Isaiah said. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and you labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, 
and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Now, I hope I don't say something that will offend anybody because I don't have that. I, that is not my, my motive or, or my desire for sure. But I know the culture here is different. And I know when we come back on furlough, at least this is what I've been told. Maybe we're being fooled or deceived or whatever. But when we come back on furlough and we've eaten all the food that we like in the, in the United States and we've gained some weight and we come back and people say, oh, you have gained weight. And to Americans, that's offensive. You don't tell us we've gained weight. We know we gained weight, okay? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's not a compliment. <laughs> it may be to you here. It's not one to us. We know we've gained weight. We need to lose that weight. That's why I'm on the treadmill all the time. But what has been told to me, the reason for that is, and probably this goes back years gone by, when really it was used for that reason, when someone said, oh, you've gained weight, it was a compliment, meaning God's blessing your life. Amen? It doesn't mean that for us Americans, believe me. <laughs> but the Lord has blessed our life. And how many people are starving? And so there, there is certainly that meaning, and we understand that, but for us, when you tell us that, you're hurting us because we know we've gained and we don't want to gain at this age, okay? If we're little skinny things, fine to gain. We're not little skinny things, okay? We're fighting that, that, that problem all the time. But here we find, what is, what is the Lord saying through Isaiah? He's saying you're, you're seeking and you're spending and you're, you're living your life trying to get something that really has no value. That's what he's saying. It's the same thing the Lord said when he said, what profit a man if he should gain the whole world uh, and lose his own soul? You're, you're working and striving and your purpose in life is for the wrong thing. When you're working for this world, listen, it, the dividends are not good. The, the benefits are not good. The motive isn't even good. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. It's anti-Bible. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have nice things. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that's when, you, when your motive and all your drive and, and, and that's when, well, I can't come to church because I'm going to work and I'm going to get more money and I'm going to get a better job and I'm going to, I don't have time for the Lord. That's what I mean. It's wrong. Priorities. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundant. When we have our priorities right we have our priorities according to the word of God and the will of God seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things that you're seeking they will be added unto you according to him according to his will He'll, he's not going to let anyone starve isn't that what David said I was young now I'm old I haven't seen any of God's people begging bread not going to happen it's God's promise we said this morning, he keeps his word. He does. Right priorities. Delight thyself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. It, it, it keeps going back to put him first, and he'll take care of you. Right motive. Howard Hughes, probably the richest man in his day. He died at 70. I hope that doesn't happen to me. Amen? Amen. <laughs> That would be very short-lived. <laughs> he died at 70 with fame and fortune. His estate was probated at approximately $2.5 billion. You know, there's a lot of billionaires now, but when he was around, there wasn't a lot of billionaires then. During his last 20 years of his life, he was hardly seen. He spent most of his final years in pajamas. Now, to some young people, that would be great, amen? <laughs> that's great. Just bring me something else. I'm still in my pajamas. No, that's not a, lot of, uh, not a lot of godliness in that. He weighed only 90 pounds. Can you imagine? Worth 2.5 billion at his time of death, he weighed only 90 pounds. Malnutritioned. Let me ask you, does that sound like a man who was satisfied? He had 
at 2.5 billion, he had all the world could offer. I mean, whatever he wanted. Nothing nor no one can satisfy the longing of mankind but Jesus Christ. How many times have I used the Rolling Stones? How many, how, how, how many, Tony knows that song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. How many of you know that song by the Rolling Stones? You know, Mick Jagger is actually still singing. <laughs> He's older than I am. He's in his middle 70s, I think, 75 if I'm not mistaken, and he's still performing. And he's probably still singing, and it's very, very true, he's probably still singing, I can't get no satisfaction. I tried, I tried, I tried, and I tried, but I can't get no. No, no, no. Mick Jagger, Rolling Stones. They also had all this world can offer. But you know something? Unless Mick Jagger and his band, I don't know if all of them are still alive, I think one or two of them pop probably has, has passed off the scene. I believe one of them has for sure. But you know, unless they, unless they turn their life around, unless they get saved, unless they come to the Lord and repent and get saved, not only in this life, and he's given, you know, Mick Jagger 70 plus years already, not only has he not found satisfaction in and of this world, he's not going to find satisfaction after this world either. If you don't find it now, you're not going to have it later. Psalm 17.5, listen to this. This is for the saved. This is for those that have Repent it. This is for those that have trusted in the Lord. The psalmist says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. I love that verse. I believe that verse ties in with the New Testament verse, 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I believe it's very possible for you and I that are living today, we have every, every possibility, I believe everything that I know that needs to take place has taken place. Nothing hindering the Lord from coming back rapturing out the church. That's what this verse is talking about. And if, if, if we die before the rapture, well, I, I love that what the psalmist says, I will be satisfied when I awake and see his likeness. To be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. You want to have a satisfied life? The more you give to the Lord, the more satisfied you'll be the more joy you will have, the more peace you will have, the more purpose you will have for your life. Will you be satisfied? Are you satisfied today? Are you satisfied this evening? If not, it's not the Lord's fault. It's the choices you have made. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you and we do thank you, dear Lord, as always, for who you are and Lord, for loving us in spite of who we are. And I thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation that you have offered to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, his death upon Calvary's cross. And dear Lord, I again pray for anyone that's here that they would not leave this place with a life of dissatisfaction, a life with no purpose, a life that will place them in an eternity of suffering and pain because of the choice they have made not to obey, not to believe, not to receive the gift of eternal life that's offered to them as a gift. It's free. Trust and obey. There's no better way to be happy in Jesus, just to trust and obey. God, help us that know you. Help us, Lord, 
to take the message tonight and allow it to, to pierce our hearts and help us to see who we are, Lord, and how far removed we are of what we should be and how still your blood covers our sin, our iniquities, our sins on purpose, the evil and wickedness of our hearts and lives, and still you're there to love us and continue to love us, never throwing us away, never throwing us out. We read this morning, your promise is, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Thank you for that promise. Forgive us, Lord, for failing over and over and over and over and over and over endlessly. And you thank you for the security we have in Christ. Pray you would bless and use this invitation, Lord, to draw not only sinners, Lord, but saints to yourself. Help us, Lord, to see us ourselves as you see us. And just have your will and way. And help us, dear God, to bless the Lord, O my soul, with all that is within me. We're asking in Jesus' name. Amen.